Hey, yo, what's going on? It's the Superstar Crossover on iHeartRadio. <laughs> I am Josh Martinez with my guest, Chris Jericho. What's going on, man? I'm here, man. I like you went into radio voice there. I did. You That's know what good. it is? When you're born and raised in New York City, uh, you, you get an accent. And then you get really lazy as you speak. And then right. on radio, I did radio in Iowa and Ohio, and I'm nationally syndicated. You got to switch it up just a little bit, just enough so that you force yourself to enunciate a little bit. You do, yeah. So that's when you get stuck in kind of the accent uh, that people don't understand sometimes. You get like when I go back to Canada, mm. you get really Canadian accent. Like, hey man, so excited <laughs> to be here on the show today. Man's awesome. How it's long... hard not to swear too. I was going to say how <laughs> long. Oh no, I'm the worst. By the way, this is all pre-recorded, so fuck it. Um, how long? do you pick up other people's accents when you're with them? Like, how long does it take you? So that's one thing I re vividly remember starting to learn what accents were. Mm. Like, after I started going on the road, like, I just thought everyone talked like I did. You know what I mean? Obviously, you know, a New York accent, but then the difference between a Boston accent, or how about this one, a Philly accent? Philly, there's a, there's a, there's a legit Philly accent mm -hmm. that a lot of people never would pick up on unless you spend a lot of time in Philly. Or the verbiage that they use, like certain the verbiage words. they use, the way yeah. they pronounce certain things. There's a California accent, too. There's yeah. a Southern California and a Northern California. Huh. Okay. You know what I mean? So you get kind of those types of, of vibes from, you know, and obviously there's a Wisconsin, there's a Chicago. Those are different. Um, so as you travel around, you start to figure out, oh, these are different accents. In Can Canada, too. Mm -hmm. There's Western Canadian, there's Eastern Canadian, there's, there, there's Maritimes Canadian, there's French Canadian. So you get to you get a chance to sample all of these amazing accents from around the world. So I, uh, doing radio in Iowa, I was out, I did time out there for like three and a half years because that's what it felt like. Like I was mm -hmm. in prison, so I re you know, refer to it as that. I would come home and then all of like my my vernacular everything would just change within me immediately the moment i get home because right. it's just like i'm back with my yeah yeah, yeah. hood rat friends basically for sure. lack of a better term. You, you slip back into your original you know mindset exactly uh but you're in new york city a familiar familiar place uh, yes you, i was you, born in new york city mm -hmm. what hospital I don't know what hospital is Manhasset, so it's on Long Island. Okay, so yeah. the, the Manhasset General Hospital. <laughs> fair, fair. Uh, so you're going to be at Otta Ash Stadium, uh, going up against Sammy Guevara. Um, what do you think is Sammy Guevara's ceiling in this industry? His ceiling? Yeah. Like his, his maximum potential. Like what is? What do you think is his maximum potential? I mean, I think I think he has potential to be a world champion. You know, that that's the best thing about what we've done in AEW over the last four years is build so many names. Uh, that came from basically nowhere into legit main eventers. And you talk about Sammy Guevara and Darby Allen and Orange Cassidy and MJF and all these types of guys. Um, that's something we knew we had to do right out of the gate because AEW became popular very quickly. Mm -hmm. But in order to sustain the popularity, you have to create as many stars as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Britt Baker's another one, of course. So many others too. Chris Statlander, et cetera, New York's own. So I think, you know, and that's another thing even with Arthur Ashe Stadium. You know, we created our own wrestling arena mm -hmm. like we didn't try and go into msg or try and go into a barclay or maybe tony did but i think arthur ash is kind of a little genius move on his part because when you think of aw in new york city it's synonymous with arthur ash it's mm -hmm. such a great wrestling building i remember the first time i walked in there i couldn't believe like no one's ever had wrestling shows here before like the seats go up the crowd's on top of you it's just metal a, ceiling, so it's louder. It it's louder, louder. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a great vibe, you know, and um, it's exciting to know that you know whenever we come to L.A. or sorry, it's kind of like, that's uh, the forum. <laughs> whenever we come to New York City, it's going to be Arthur Ashe Stadium, and it's for the third time we hit there tonight. So uh, going into a show like this, this question came from Rob D. Felice, so I got to show him love. Uh, do you have multiple uh, opponents in mind? Like, obviously, you know that you're going to be coming back to New York City, Arthur Ashe, a big stadium. Do you have people in mind that you want to work with specifically for that show? Or do you kind of let the story No, dictate? you go where the story dictates. You, you always, you let the story lead you. Mm. You don't try and lead the story. Because if you're trying to do that, you're almost like stuffing the story into a round hole if it's a square peg of a story. So wherever wherever the, the, the story takes you. Um, and sometimes, you know, you always want to do a big match at Arthur Ashe. But if we were at a different part in this tale that we're telling, maybe it's just a promo or maybe it's just a backstage bit. You know, you, obviously it's a bigger venue. It's New York City. So, yes, it's perfect for, for Sammy and Jericho. I mean, that was almost discussed to do that Um uh, after Wembley at the pay-per-view in Chicago. So obviously, you know, maybe we'll wait a couple of weeks and do it in, in, in New York City. So we kind of recreate the story and kind of add to it or subtract from it to, to land on this date. But once again, once you finish this show tonight, 
then you've got another show next Wednesday and you've got another pay-per-view after that. So the story has to be a, a overreaching arc and obviously you want to hit certain moments. Okay, Wembley needs to have something big and Arthur Ashe needs to have something big, but you don't want to you know, disclaim uh, Denver next week or okay. whatever it may be. Yeah, yeah. So it all depends on where you're at. And then we have such a huge roster too. So even if like Chris Jericho only had a promo tonight, well, then maybe, you know, Adam Cole has a has a match or Samoa Joe and MGF have a match or whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, when it comes to, to All in London, right, were you nervous going out there in front of 80-plus thousand people? What's I that mean, nervous energy like? I think I'm always nervous in a yeah. good way. Okay. I think when you stop being nervous is probably when you should maybe not do this anymore. Mm. For me, I, I don't know if nervous was the word. I just knew that I had a, a lot to do. Because not only did I have a huge match against Will Ospreay, uh, I also had to sing myself to the ring with Fozzie. Um, and we started on top of a riser, and I did like the Freddie Mercury call and response heyos. And then Judas starts, and then I got to run down a flight of stairs, run across a alleyway, uh, and then get to a ladder, climb down a ladder from, from the top of the... Of, of the platform down to the bottom of the tunnel holding a microphone in ears in and get there in time to say you are beautiful so it's like that was pressure you know not, not nervousness but it's like I hope I don't like fall off this ladder I hope my mic doesn't drop or I hope the, the inner ears don't fall out and then once I finally get all that done oh yeah now I got a you know 15 minute match that I got to worry about as well and it has to be good because all eyes are on us under the microscope so um, I, I think it, it was one of those things where nervous wasn't a word it was just like sometimes I wonder what the hell did I get myself into like it seemed like a good idea at the time but um, it worked out amazing it was it was awesome and, and one of the highlights of my career for sure um, you did a really good job by the way on your most recent episode of Talk is Jericho kind of talking about that entire Wembley situation oh cool thank you yeah um, so people could find that Talk is Jericho is the name of the podcast so definitely check it out uh, one of the more recent episodes um, and going into details it's it's it's. I love when when performers are able to peel back the curtain yeah. for little things like talking about the in it's like no one ever knows like yeah that they're molded into your ear but if it falls out that's one thing you got to worry about getting it back in and those those little things or you know maybe you're rehearsing it this way and then all of a sudden some couple stagehands decide to move chairs to well, an area or, or here's another one that you don't even really think of is like yeah the inner ears are important and also to have it over the top of this big bulky jacket mm -hmm. um but another thing is when you're singing in a stadium that big i mean it's cavernous right now the band is also a hundred feet behind me and fifty feet higher than me, so there's a, a a delay delay, right? So when I first came down, like if you watch, I'm a I'm a slight half second off okay. the beat for a bit until PJ, our bass player, starts singing the back, and I will drag you down. It's like oh, I'm a little bit behind. I better speed up. So that was another thing that you never think about. Like this is I'm not even close to where the band is, so I'm hearing them in my ears but there's also people singing it in real time so that was weird you know what I mean and it made me realize like you know if, if a band is playing like in a stadium you know and you're running down like I mentioned the stones if if you're running down the catwalk and mix down there like what is Keith and Ronnie hearing and it's like that's a whole other level of musicianship to where you have to compensate for that too so that was a really cool learning experience now this is a legitimate text message I got on August 27th at 5.47pm from my cousin Willie Okay. Really? Yeah. Okay. That Jericho intro to the ring may have been the greatest intro to a ring of all time, if not top three. So that was right after Wembley. That was yeah. that was Willie's reaction. I mean, I, I, once again, like I just do the stuff and let people decide. But uh, it was definitely one of my top three entrances. You know, the the only one I could think of that might have even been close. Mm. Um, was we did uh, it was Jericho versus Moxley in right before the pandemic I think when he when he beat me for the title which is interesting I lose the AEW world title and then the world shuts down a month later coincidence I don't know I think not um <laughs> but there was like a, a choir yes the choir sang sang me to the ring like an old school gospel choir that was really cool um obviously this one I'm not gonna say beat it, but it's it, those were probably the two entrances that I could think of that really stand out as just the two best that I can that I can remember. But yeah, Wembley, you can't 
No one had ever done that before. Sang themselves to the ring, you know, with their with their band, you know, playing behind them. It it's so it. fascinating because when that I, I read that on a tweet, it might have been like maybe a, a tweet that you put out or AW uh, leading into the show, and it was when it was announced that you were going to perform. It's like this is the first time ever, and then you take a step back and you realize there's been so many performances in wrestling, but no one. Shawn Michaels isn't doing it or Sensational Sherry Yeah, I mean, and it, I, I, Cena might have wrapped himself to the ring. I don't even know. But, I mean, but, he, does, he, does, he does like what Max Caster does, so it's like a different thing every night. Right, but this is with, with an actual rock and yeah. roll band with the song that everybody sings anyways, you know? So I, I think that was a first, which is another reason why it appealed to me so much. Actually, it was suggested by, by, by Bully Ray, by Bubba Dudley. Oh, wow, He's like, okay. you know, you got to do that. I was like, you think? I was like, Wow. <laughs> And then the Freddie Mercury Hayos was suggested by Ortiz. He was like, you know, we came because we played a gig on Friday and Wembley was Sunday. And he came to the show on Friday. He's like, oh, it was such a great show. And you guys are so awesome. Because you got to do the Freddie Mercury call and response um, at Wembley. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting idea. So, yeah, you got to listen to your friend's advice sometimes, especially when it's good ideas. And like let me that. tell you, there, there's something about Puerto Ricans from New York City that are geniuses. <laughs> God damn it. You hear me? Absolute Absolutely. Geniuses. No doubt. Uh, going back to Willie, he actually had a really good question. You've been in the game for a while. Um, he wants to know, who comes to mind when I ask this question? Which performer had world championship potential, but for whatever reason never got there? First one that comes to mind. Well, if you want to go old school, I mean, Roddy Piper was one. And that's just because he refused to do the job for Hogan. So Hogan could never <laughs> lose to him because he would never lose it back. But Roddy could have been world champion. I think, I think you know, Razor Ramon, Scott Hall is another one that, that, that should have been world champ. Um, modern times, I mean, you can't say because people haven't, their careers aren't over yet. You know, I mean, I think, I mean, I, th I think Orange Cassidy could be world champion. I think Darby Allen could be world champion. I think, um, I mean, gosh, there's so many names you could say. We mentioned Sammy Guevara could be world champion. You know, um, a guy like Danny Garcia in five or mm. 10 years could be world champion. So sports those, entertainer, Daniel. Sports Garcia. entertainer, those types of names. But yeah, if you talk about the, the classic guys, those are the ones that kind of pop into my head. Is 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 because you know back then too, like now ch championships change quite frequently. Mm -hmm. Not so much in AW, but in WWE they do. Back in those days, early eighties, you'd you'd be the champion for four years. So you know if you missed your window, you might never see it again. I I actually tweeted last night and posted on my Instagram that for some reason because I'm a diehard fan. I could name every heavyweight champion from like 1984 to 1999, the event they won, and in most cases, the wow. In most cases, sound like Tony Khan. But that's why we were able to hang out last <laughs> night for a while. But but I think after '99, and to go back to your point, where like titles change hands so much, constantly. That, yeah, because it's so easy. Because you just think, okay, you know, especially in the '80s, you go, it was more or less WrestleMania to WrestleMania. Yeah, is kind of how things went. How important is uh, the the length of time? To hold a title nowadays compared to let's say twenty years ago. I mean, I think I think it's important to hold it for for a while. Mm -hmm. I remember being the champion, losing it to Batista in some like taboo Tuesday where the fans mm -hmm. voted for the stipulation or whatever. Is that a shoot, by the way? Uh, yeah, it was a okay. shoot, which is stupid, but whatever. It's like, like everyone thinks it's it's a gimmick, except for the guys actually in the ring. The first one I did was show, uh, where it was Intercontinental Championship, where there was twenty choices. And legit, I said I said to to the director Kevin Dunn, just give me the top three. He's like, nope, we're not telling anything. So I'm the only one who's getting worked. <laughs> so I had to go to 20 guys and go, what's your finish, uh, and what's a move you like to do? Like, Which, you know, I remember watching that. It was actually yes. in the department, and it was like Shelton was a bit of a surprise. Yeah, he was I, on the come up. He, but it was, he a was bit like, of a I thought he would. He was one of my top five choices. Okay. So when he gets announced and comes to the ring, so I don't know who I'm wrestling, and I don't know what the finish is. They're going to tell me that when I'm in the ring. Now, everybody else oh, on that shit. show, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> everybody else on that show had, okay, it's Jericho versus uh, so-and-so, you know, whatever. Kane versus Undertaker in a street fight, false cut anywhere, or uh, no rules match. Like, those three are all pretty much the same. You can come up with a match. Like, me, Jericho versus the winner of these 20 guys, and we don't know what the finish is till we get in there. So, Sheldon, so he got in there, and then, and then <laughs> you can see it when you watch it. Shelton comes to the ring and then the referee says uh, Vince says Shelton's going over I'm like okay what's his finish and he said something like a like a like a T T bar he said, but he said T T bar suplex and you can see me like it looks like I'm mad I'm like what what's a T bar suplex he's like T T bone suplex. what's a T bone suplex what are you talking about it looks like I'm arguing with him about that I could care less about that I just want to know what the hell what the hell a T bone suplex is. 
So we're, we have the match. I call the whole thing on the fly. Which it actually turned out really awesome. And at the end, it's like, okay, throw me in the corner, and I'm going to jump on the second rope, and give me your finish. So I, I didn't know what a T-bone bar suplex was. So when I jumped in the second, I turned around, and I just jumped at him like a starfish because I figured whatever a T-bar suplex is, you can hook it yeah. as long as I give you my arms and legs. Huh. So I landed, he hooked me, and gave me the T-bone bar suplex, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> but but going back to your question, we did that with Batista, where, where Austin was the guest referee, and so so I lost it to Dave, and then won it back the next week in a cage match because Vince just wanted the Taboo Tuesday to have some validity. Like, well, if the fans pick this, it's gonna work. Like, I don't know, it's kind of dumb, but but think about like being a champion for a week doesn't really help anybody, you know. So I think it's better to have it, you know, for for at least some length of time, you know, a couple months at least. So on on this on the topic of longevity, uh, your career has been incredible. As far as I know, as a as a regular fan, you haven't had any major injuries. Now last night on Monday Night Football, Nick Chubb. I don't know if you saw it or not. I didn't. Horrific. I'll show it to you. Off no. Here. Horrific leg injury. Oh. It, similar to Willis McGahee in like the 2001. Uh, like National a Theisman thing or something, or similar, a, yeah. A Sid vicious, not as bad. Oh, oh that was that, the worst. Ooh. 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 That, yeah, that that just gave me chills, and I hate me you too. for bringing that one up. But, yeah. uh, but that kind of got me thinking. Like, it, this guy plays football all the time, taking handoffs. He's a running back, and it just happens. Yeah. And wrestling injuries just happen. I yep. mean, you had a situation with Neville years ago on Raw where you had to call things on the fly with the referee to get That's a disqualification. Right. I got in a fight with the referee. And <laughs> so he told me. <laughs> I pushed him so he would de- disqualify me because Neville was screaming in the ring. So, uh, is it is it luck? Is it technique? Is it talent to, to avoid these injuries for you? I mean, I think it's just fate. Mm. You know, I mean, you can you can try to you know limit any type of crazy, super crazy bumps that you're going to take, but you know, something like a leg injury or whatever, you know, can just happen at any time. You know what I mean? So. I think it's one of those things like we're we're controlled. It's controlled chaos, but it's still chaos, you know. So it can happen. It it does happen, you know. It happened to to Darius Martin a few months ago, and, and, and Ooh, he had a pretty bad injury. Yeah. So um, once again, you, you try and protect each other the best you can, and you know we're all pros, so we know what we're doing. But there's still that chance that something could could happen, and you just never know. Well, the Neville one, I think, was like a very typical baseball slide. Dude, it was, yeah, baseball slides are the worst. Like, I've seen guys tear their Achilles on baseball slides. I've seen guys break their ankles on baseball slides, which is what happened mm-hmm. to Neville. Uh, pack. Um, yeah, so you just have to, you know, just have to go with it. And, and hopefully everybody is good. And you never want to see anybody get hurt. It's the worst thing that could possibly happen. So... Um, we, we do work together uh, and, and try and protect each other as much as possible. Do you have... Uh, you, you've had numerous tag team title reigns with numerous people. Do you have any particular favorite tag team partners? Yeah, Big Show is my favorite tag team partner. Really? Yeah, he was the best, yeah. Um, Jarrah Show. Show, yeah, which we never actually called ourselves that. The announcers called us that. I wouldn't allow them to call us that because <laughs> Big Show wanted to make T-shirts, and I was like, we're not making T-shirts. We're not having any merch. He's like, what do you mean we're not having any merch? I, I, didn't, I didn't think heels should have merch. I was like, mm. we'll make our money main eventing pay-per-views against the baby faces that sell merch. And he always wanted to make Jarrah Show shirts, so... Um, maybe someday we'll have to do that. But uh, um, he was great. Great, great chemistry. At the time, he was kind of floundering, and I said, we're going to make this guy, I told Vince, we're going to make him like a giant destroyer. Like, just he kills everybody and get rid of that Andre the Giant singlet, like put him in, you know, like a real singlet or whatever it was, and kind of re- reinvented him. And we had a we had a, a great, great run there. It was, it was a blast. With one of the best breakups in history. We, we treated it like a rom-com at the end where it's like, you know, I'm still always going to think about you and it's like, you know, I just don't know what I'm going to do without you. We'll always have December or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, when, when talking about iconic breakups, the Kevin Owens one obviously comes to mind. Yeah. Uh, I got that feeling seeing the you and Don Callis situation to start yeah. the Osprey match. Um, was that kind of, not your motivation, but was that kind of on your mind too of like, this worked so well what little nuances can we take to make it work a little bit on this side? Yeah, the Kevin Owens Festival of Friendship was, was I think, one of the greatest moments in, in Raw history. And exactly. I say that completely unegotistically. I think it was, I, I wanted that segment to start off like an 80s David Lee Roth video and end like the Red Wedding from Game of Thrones, mm. where you just were like, no, don't do it, don't do it. And I had to fight for that. I had to fight for it. Yeah, I had to fight for it a lot. Some people did not want to do it. Like Triple H did not want to do it, and Vince was actually not there that day. So I was like, I called Vince when he was on a plane, 
and um or text Vincent who's on the plane and he's like well, what's the problem we're doing it just like we said we were going to do it I'm like okay there's the evidence <laughs> show the phone everyone shut your ass shut the fuck up um and I wanted it to be like where where the list of KO and, and like, why is my name on this like what is going on here because I wanted I wanted it to look up and see him and be like there's no way don't do it don't do it like if you're if you're watching a horror movie and you know the killer comes behind somebody and kills them well you're scared but the person never knows what happens if you're watching a horror movie and the person sees the killer come through the door and you know like oh I'm so dead like this is the worst ever that's what I wanted I wanted to see him and know that he's going to kill me but there's no way you can't believe it and then he does and I think that's why it worked so well it was, it was such a, a great just betrayal moment you know and we, we, we kind of mirrored that with the Don Callis, with mm -hmm. the painting and all that sort of stuff. And I thought that worked really well, too. Like, a lot of people said, well, the Osprey build, match didn't have a good build. Well, well Will was in Japan up until two weeks prior. Mm -hmm. But I think that match had a great build because it was all based around Don Callis and Chris Jericho. And we knew that. So we, we, we backed it out six weeks and started with Don and Chris. So when Will's available, now he comes and attacks. And that's the big reveal, you know? And that story's not over yet either. There's mm -hmm. so much more to come with that too. So I think a lot of times fans get mad when they're like, don't know everything at once. And that makes me laugh because if I go see a movie, I don't want to know the finish of the movie before it's even started watching it. But I think a lot of wrestling fans feel entitled. Like, we that was stupid. It's like, it didn't make any sense. Well, can you watch the whole thing? And if it's a three-month story, then tell me what you think about it when it's done. But in week eight out of... 16 weeks don't tell me that doesn't make any sense because Pulp Fiction makes no sense either unless you watch the whole thing <laughs> if you leave Pulp Fiction halfway through this is stupid this is so dumb why did John Travolta get shot in the bathroom and he's not even now he's back alive again this is stupid watch the movie see the whole story the way that the directors and the writers and the actors want you to see it and then you make your that's you a Tarantino judgment. thing it's like he starts from ending to beginning back well he to does and yeah. may, may, maybe sometimes we might do some of that you know, in, in AEW as well. Just kind of throw some monkey wrenches in there and some red herrings to throw you off the case. So now, uh, one of the big things, and to, to kind of touch upon rumors and fans, one of the big rumors, no need to, to get into it really, Edge, Adam Copeland, rumors that he might sign with AEW. <sighs> Hypothetically speaking, what would someone like him, the value be to the AEW locker room in 2023? Well, I mean, you know, who's to say for sure? Mm -hmm. But if you look at, you know... Chris Jericho, for example, where, where I was in WWE, like there really wasn't much more that I could do there. Um, you know, you're there for for many years and you've wrestled everybody, and it's great, but it's always good to shock people and to show up with a new kind of mission. So I think somebody like like Edge, you know, um, there's a lot of guys over there like this. They've kind of done everything they can do there. And for him to come to AEW, he'd be a whole fresh new coat of paint, a whole new roster of matches that he could have. Um, you know, obviously a new name, which would, <laughs> which would, which would then, knowing him, knowing me, what I would do is a whole new look, mm. um, a whole new mindset. So you know, I mean, that's the best thing about having AEW and about us being as successful as we are is that there's now a viable, you know. Um, Alternative. I don't want to say competitor because yeah. it's not that, but you can now go to either company. And that's what was so great about WCW in the 90s was that you could switch and jump. And I remember Rick Rude being in two companies at the same time because he had night. jumped to WCW, but they had taped Raw in advance. And it's like, that's exciting. And so, he shaved the mustache. He did, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think it's exciting, and uh, whether he comes or not, or anybody that comes from there to here, anybody that comes from here to there. I mean, look at Cody. When he left mm -hmm. AEW to go to WWE, I mean, it was a whole whole new world for him. So I think that that's one of the most exciting things when you can have the, the guys going back and forth. It, it really does make it more exciting for the fans, and it makes it better for the business. You recently worked with Sting for the first time, if I remember. How fun was that? It was really fun. Yeah, it was good. I just couldn't believe that after these careers that both of us had had, you know, over 30 years a piece that we had never touched. Yeah. Never even been in the same ring ever. We we had the, our director Keith Mitchell retired a year or two years ago and Sting and I were in the ring to like wish him well. It was the only time we were ever in the ring together <laughs> ever. So I always knew that before before he was done or I was done that we, we needed to do something. And it was a short story, but it was it was a good story. It was fun. 
Uh, I love the way it ended with the the no DQ match or whatever we did, tornado match in, in Hamilton, Ontario, of all places. That was a great way to, to end that little chapter. And, you know, it, it's like we don't do live events in AEW. If we did live events, Sting and I and Darby and Sammy probably could work you know, around the horn for months. It was that easy of a match. You know, when you get to that point of a guy who's been around that long, people are just excited by the by the possibility of of us touching. And, and it was uh, it was it was a lot of fun. Very cool. Who do you think right now is one of the more underrated performers in the game? It doesn't even have to be AEW if someone happens to catch your eye. I mean, it's it's interesting because what exactly does underrated mean? You know, mm. like somebody that hasn't reached their full potential yet, or someone that has the potential but hasn't really started. I think Danny Garcia is not underrated, but I think I think he's a guy that, like, when I first started working with him, I thought, okay, well, let's let's the story dictates that I'm in a group with Danny Garcia, and then once I started working with him, I realized that this guy's really good. The subtleties that he has, he gets it. So uh, I wouldn't say underrated, but I think he's a guy that's got a huge, huge future for us. Um, you know, like that, that, that sort of a name hits me right now, you know? Um, so th- there's other guys too, but I think, I think at this point guys are really starting to branch out. Like a guy like Orange Cassidy, for example, when I, when I first came to AW, I was like, this guy sucks. Like this whole thing is stupid. It's, it's mocking the business. And but then I realized like, like, you know, get your head out of your ass. He's super popular. Why? Let me analyze this for a bit, and then I realize he's doing something completely different. No one's ever done it before, and it's really cool. You can dress up like him, you know, and he's really good. And then I started thinking, well, let's maybe do something together. We worked a 14-week program in the middle of the pandemic in front of nobody. That was amazing. The only thing that sucked was there was no fans to watch it. But, um, you know, that, that's kind of something where, where you, you, you look at somebody and get a little kernel of what they're doing great, and then you can expand upon that. I mean, Pac is one of those guys. Mm. I mean, Pac is is... is a tremendous performer. He's also a really good promo, you know. And much like Will Ospreay, his voice doesn't sound like anybody else from England. He sounds like a, like a bastard. Like mm-hmm. he sounds like somebody from Game of Thrones. Like Will Will sounds like a street thug from East London, and Pac sounds like uh, like a bastard from 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 Northern England, you know, which is exactly where he's from. And that translates because you know people like uniqueness in wrestling you know and those guys have something that no one else brings to the table which is just their presentation the way they talk and I think there's a lot of potential for, for Pac as well he's 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 currently um, injured but when he comes back I think there's a lot we could do with him there's lots of others but those guys popped in my head first so we have a few more minutes uh, but you talk about uniqueness what do you think is uh, Bray Wyatt's legacy to the wrestling world so um, Bray was like a, a like a like a f- like a faucet of creativity. Like he had so many ideas that were just pouring out of him at all times. So we'd be like, "Let's do this. We got to do this." Be, oh, 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 oh. Let's, let's go back to the second one. What was the second one again? Mm. Um, I don't think anybody ever really ever uh, very unique. You know, that's, and that's why he, he did so good and was so successful because no one really thought thought about wrestling the way that he did with the characters that he created and, and the things that he committed to that no one else could really make work like like obviously Bray Wyatt might have been the best of them but when that started getting a little bit stale then he goes to like the fiend but the like the, the firehouse firefly, firefly funhouse like yeah. if you pitched that to me I'd be like what are you talking about like how is this gonna work but then once you see him do it, it's like, this is so great. And it's so wrestling. It's like dinner debonair that, that MGF <laughs> yep. and I had. You couldn't get away with that unless you committed to it a thousand percent. Because wrestling is is that. Wrestling is the Firefly Funhouse. But to be able to think about that and create it and make it a thing. And there's all these different characters. And it's like Mr. Rogers on crack, but it's cool. And it's like, that to me was the best of Bray Wyatt. Like, it's hard to translate that into a match. But like I said earlier, matches are almost secondary. It's characters and connecting with people and 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 making them want to see you perform. And that's what Bray Wyatt could do better than almost anybody in the modern era. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's another reason why it's such a shame that that he's gone because I'm sure he had so many other ideas, some good, some bad, mm-hmm. the, the, a faucet of creativity, you know. And and, and the, th- the thing for me is like you don't see guys when you know when you leave companies or when they leave or you leave but then you think back like man I spent a lot of time with him I think we worked gosh at least two dozen times all over the world mm. you know and probably more than that but just you know you work somebody ten nights in a row and you're in you know Belgium tonight and you were in 
Portugal tomorrow and then we're back to England then we're over to Germany and it's like you don't even know where you are and you have great matches during the during the evening and then you're drinking at night and then you wake up and you don't know what the fuck's going on and it's like it makes you friends for life you know yeah. um, so a little that was a bit of a personal question and, and your thoughts on his legacy another personal question maybe a little more fun do you have any go-to spots when you come to New York? A place that you have to go to, whether it's a bar or maybe a type of food, something that you look forward to every time you come back no, home? I really just like like Manhattan. You know, I just like the vibe of downtown New York. Um, it's not like I have to, to go anywhere because it's, weird. it's interesting. Like now we're, we're Arthur Ashe, so that would basically, we're based usually out Queens. by LaGuardia, like Queens area, right? So that's why this press day is great because now I can like I always used to stay downtown because we'd always work the garden mm -hmm. or if you're working you know Meadowlands you still stay downtown because you don't want to stay in Jersey who does no offense <laughs> you know and, and, and same with and then if you're at like you know Nassau Coliseum you still got to fly out you know so I would always stay down here always and and I remember some nights just walking around, you know, I remember early on when Chris Angel was just like a local music, uh, magician doing like card tricks at WWE New York, if you remember yeah. WWE New York. So uh, he used to, he used to work there. Linda McMahon hired him to do, to do like I said, like, you know, parlor tricks. And he's like, Hey dude, like I'm going to be in this, this tank of water for 24 <laughs> hours. Like, and I'm stuck, like, it's in the lobby of WWE New York. Like, come visit me. So I was like, yeah, sure, I'll come visit you. So we do the show at the Garden, and I come down, and I walk to, to WWE New York, and Chris is in this big, giant tank of water for, like I said, for 24 hours. And he was in there for about, I don't know, 15 hours at that point. He looked like Luke Skywalker in Empire Strikes Back. He's all white, and he's just kind of, like, in a tank of freaking water. So I'm like, hey, dude, like, I don't even know if he can <laughs> see me or whatever. And it's after the show, so I, I had a piece of pizza that I bought from from a, a downtown vendor. I had and I was really into yogurt at the time, so I had a yogurt. <laughs> and I'm looking at Chris, and I'm like eating my pizza, and I'm like, you know, good. Day. And I remember I opened the yogurt, and you know, sometimes you open a yogurt, a little, oh, yeah, yeah. little bloop, a little bloop went onto the glass. To the, this guy comes over, he's like, dude. What are you doing? I said, well, I'm just saying to my friend, he's been in the tank for 18 hours. He hasn't eaten. And you're eating pizza and spraying yogurt over his freaking tank? Like, you're, you're mean. You're the worst friend ever. And I was like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And then when I talked to him afterwards, I said, oh, I'm so sorry. He's like, dude, I didn't see, a, I was in such a daze. Like, it was the worst idea I've ever had. They pulled him out of this damn thing. He looked like the, like the limpest, wettest <laughs> Coney Island whitefish, <laughs> if you know, you know yeah. that you could ever see. And uh, but yeah, that, that, that's that's I would just that's what I would do in New York. Just go walk around yeah. and just experience stuff. So uh, before we wrap things up, um, I'm gonna be a father for the first time. Oh, a girl dad. That's right. Well, congratulations. Having, thank you. Thank you. She's due in about a week and a half. Nice. Yeah, uh, I believe you have daughters, right? I do. Yeah. What sport do you think I should get her in to start? See, that's the thing when, when you have kids. Like, you can try and point them in directions. Like, swimming is always important. You got to teach the kid to swim. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, I don't know how to swim. Well, that's the, <laughs> see, that's why you got to take her swimming. And, and dude, you, you stand in the shallow end and they flutter around and you'll be fine. But, yeah, you, you got to teach the kids to swim. That's a great, okay. uh, that's, a, that's a great one. I remember my, my kids, especially my son, used to just, he liked to just go to the bottom of the pool and just, like, hang out there, hold his breath and be like, there's a kid and he's fine. He's fine. There's a kid at the bottom of the pool. Trust me, he's cool. This is the war, you're the worst. Trust me, and then he comes to the top. Ash, don't stand on there so long, okay? <laughs> Down he goes again. Swimming is important. So the other thing is, like, you know, what you try and put them in sports that you like. You know, like, I remember my girls, for example, like, we tried baseball, softball. Mm. One of them liked it because I have twins. One of them liked it, one of it doesn't. And then one of them came home one day, and she just said she wants to be a floor hockey goalie. So uh, she's a floor hockey goalie now, and they're taking these shots, and you know she's saving them, and so that was kind of cool. But I never expected her to be a floor hockey goalie. Yeah. Um, and then there's you know some track and field, and something sometimes they just don't want to do sports. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like you just have to let them do whatever they want to do, but tr but give them as many options as possible. I remember my, my daughter Sierra; she was playing a cardboard box once, mm -hmm. and she had some real rhythm. I was like. I'm gonna buy her a drum set. You want a drum set? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bought this like little kid drum set, and like I played it more than she did. She never touched it again. And I was like, it could have been a drummer. I was gonna say it, it could have also been one of those ideas that are good on paper at the time. Yeah, then... <laughs> that's the thing with kids. Like they let them try as many things as they want, and you never know, right? I remember when I was a kid, I tried all these different things. I remember like I I, I wanted to be in this acting class so bad, and I think it's because I knew they had a really cool Christmas party. <laughs> 
And I really want to say, if, if you sign up now for the rest of the year, you get to go to the Christmas party. I was like, yes, please, please, please. And I signed up. I went to the Christmas party and then never went again. And my mom was so mad at me. Like, you, you, you just wanted to go to the Christmas party. It's like, well, I guess. But it was a really fun party. But, you know, like, to let kids just do as much as they so, can. So my child's going to live basically outside of Dayton, Ohio, and I'm going to stay here. Right. So obviously you've been on the road a lot of your time. What would you say is the best bit of advice for someone who is maybe going to miss a good chunk of kind of the early years? For me, like, when I, when I was home, when I am home, although one of my kids is gone, the other two are about to leave, I just spent as much time with my kids as possible. Like, I would give them a ride to school every morning, no matter what time I got home at. You, know, you have to get up at, like, 6 and make them lunch and make them breakfast, like, all, all that stuff. Because if you're gone for, you know, 10 days and you're home for 5, but you're sleeping till 2 and not really doing anything, to me, the balance was, like, you know, I'll sleep later, but when I'm home, I want to be there and do as much as I can for kids. You know, I coached the floor hockey team and mm. and that sort of stuff. You know, I remember uh, my son's football team. I was the chain guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I didn't know what to do. They're like, you got to move the chain because that's where the ball is. And it's like, well, do I move forward or backwards or whatever? Like, you know, Chris Jericho doesn't know how to work a chain on a football field, but you know, I tried, right? But that sort of stuff. Just be there as much as you can when you're when you're around them. Like if you're seeing her in Dayton and you're there for five days then just hang out as much as you can for those five days as early in the morning and as late as you can that's the plan uh one more time aew grand slam dynamite sammy guevara chris jericho by the way just to get into the building it's only 20 bucks to get into the building uh one of the biggest events of the year right here in queens easy breezy beautiful one more time, Chris Jericho. Appreciate you stopping by, bro. Yeah, man. We're excited. It's always great to be in New York City. And like I said, Arthur Ashe is our home. And uh, it's a great. It's going to be a great show. It's always a great show with AW, but it's always an extra, extra special when we're in New York City. Or Queens. <laughs> it's New York City. Don't worry about it. <laughs>